The primary issue is that just society at large is okay with dying. People are okay, or they think they are, with the concept of, you know, getting old and dying. And when you tell them, uh, and I was the same when I just heard, first heard about it, that wouldn't you want to live like a thousand years? People are like, no, why would you, who would want to live so long? And they, they start saying all those kind of the same cliche things that everybody says that when they just first hear about this concept of radical life extension, like overpopulation, you'd get bored, blah, blah, blah. And so I think it, it, it's just our inherent conditioning, learned helplessness, that we as children grow up with the baggage of the previous, you know, thousands of generations of before us who died and really couldn't do anything about aging. Uh, because, you know, they didn't have the tools, the, the, they didn't have the science, and we, we probably are the first generation to actually have a chance to do something about it. We, we are the first ones who have genetic engineering and all these sorts of tools that were just, you know, science fiction 20 years ago. And, of course, maybe that's why we have this, this psychological tool of denial and learned helplessness as a result to be able to not, you know, waking up in horror every day knowing that we're going to die and there's nothing we can do about it. And I think Aubrey de Grey put it pretty, pretty well in one of our conversations, is that like for thousands of years before us, we couldn't do anything about aging. And so if you can't do, about, can't do anything about something, then your desire to do something about it is, is, is useless. It's vanishes, It's yeah. irrelevant, yeah. Um, but now, and maybe people don't know and don't realize, or just because they're conditioned to think that aging is okay, first of all, we, that, that's the... the thing is we need to change then the society to first think of the aging as something bad and something that we can do something about. And what about you? How did you change your mind? You said that you were just like those people. Yeah, absolutely. It was gradual. In denial. In denial. Yeah, and, and the thing is, because I was in, in like in pharma even before I was a transhumanist. And so I, I was kind of working on things against, you know, prevent death and disease. And like they, they seemed totally cool or I, I was totally cool with like curing Alzheimer's, curing cancer. But when, when you, you're presented with the idea of why don't you just cure everything and just not die? To me, that was again, like very, very unusual thought because I was just coming from traditional like back, background of, of people thinking about death as something natural. And, you know, and this is the thing. You have this kind of the psychological blocks from changing your, your views, changing your beliefs. And when someone challenges your beliefs, then, you know, dying is okay. And they're like, no, dying is not okay. You recoil and you're like, no, I'm, this is my belief. I need to defend it. And so you start throwing out like those things that you think prop up your belief, like, oh, I'm doing this for humanity's sake, earth's sake, you know, I'm willing to die. So there's no over, overpopulation. And you throw this kind of snowball at, at the person trying to uh, get you interested in the idea of not dying and they're like no you know earth is going to be fine there's definitely not not a reason to keep mm -hmm. dying and you're like oh it's going to get boring so i don't want to live long and it, but then you know when you're kind of you you go away and you just think about it on your own you're not challenged by it. like because i think this happens when you we're challenged externally we recoil and we defend our position but when we kind of in would not challenge, just, you know, sit and think on our own or maybe read a book <clears throat> and just think about things without any preconceived notions, keep an open mind. And you realize that, yeah, it totally makes sense that you should live as long as you want. I mean, why wouldn't you want to live as long as you want? At some point, if you stop wanting to live, then you die. Why should this be kind of ex made external on you when you should die and when you should get sick? And then it's just, you know, being able to logically think this through without emotional preconditioning to, that you have to defend your position. I think that's what helped me realize that, damn, I was wrong. You know, my views were wrong. And probably when presented with convincing evidence, rational people should change their wrong views. And so that's what I did. And the more I thought about it, the more I read, the more I kind of learned about you know, biology, I realized that, damn, yeah, this is something that we should do and we're able to do. Today, we have the tools or tools are emerging when I started, I don't know, it was like six, seven years ago. Tools were emerging that we were just about to be able to do the things that I thought and I still think 
we need to do to radically extend our lives, which are you know, genetic engineering or epigenetic engineering, because I really think it's the genes, stupid, uh, that control our aging. And we need to be able to manipulate our genes, whether, you know, uh, epigenetically or with genetic engineering. Well, you said that uh, a rational person changes uh, his or her mind uh, once presented with uh, evidence. Mm -hmm. But the problem is that uh, most people don't. And I think Eliezer Yudkovsky in his uh, essays uh, uh, at Less Wrong website said that uh, most people, when they encounter rational evidence against uh, their point of view, they grow even more confident in their point of view, trying to defend it, as you also said. So how to talk to people, uh, maybe older generation, conservative people who, who, who don't want to change their mind, how to speak to your parents or grandparents who, for example, don't buy your arguments that they should uh, think about cryonics. Do you have any experience in this? I do. I mean, I, I tried to convince my own parents to sign up for cryonics. So was I it, failed. You failed. Uh, well, at least at this point, because the, 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 I think they just decided to uh, silence me. They said, yeah, yeah, okay, we'll think about it. Just not now, like a little later. Uh, so you have signed up for cryonics? I have signed up for and, cryonics. And after that, you, you tried to convince yeah, them? Yeah, or in peril. I was like, yeah. look, I'm signing up. Come on. Why... Why don't you just don't Why don't you just sign this document in parallel? I'll just get you copies and you know. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, the older we get, the more closed our mindset becomes, and this is just biological reality. Probably serves some biological function. So, it's definitely harder and harder to talk to older generations, and maybe at some point there's just nothing you can do to change their minds. Or, you know, maybe there's just some segment of population that, again, there's nothing you can do to change their minds. But the hope is that you can get to younger people who are, you know, biologically more open to, to learning, to new ideas, who, whose minds are still open and who can change their beliefs. And so I think that that's the, that's the kind of the, the right approach is to, as always, with new ideas, you have to just... I know it sounds awful, but you have to wait until the people who espouse their own ideas kind of die off or give way, although this is not a very transhumanist thing to say. But unfortunately, this, this is the reality of how things are changed in the past, how society has changed in the past. And uh, we just see like it's the new generations, they grow up with new concepts. And I think this is what's going to happen. This is happening, actually, because like the way we talk about transhumanism with the way we talk about longevity now is vastly more, uh, you know, friendlier to this idea than five years ago. Uh, like much more, many more people, even older people. So it's not necessarily like just a young, young pe person's uh, game. Even, even older people are much more friendly. And also there's like a secondary effect that if someone's children start embracing these ideas, then the parents, like looking at the children, start thinking, okay, maybe it's not a bad idea after all. And, and so I think the answer to your question is we have to target the younger people, the younger audiences who are open-minded, who grow up with kind of the values systems closer to our, our own and who are able to maybe change their worldviews and to understand that they kind of the principles that they grew up with from their parents about aging and about dying and about wanting to die were wrong. And that it's totally okay to have a different perspective and to even, you know, have a differing opinion from, from your parents. And I think this is the, the, the way to slowly, unfortunately be a slow process, slowly change society and have eventually a generation of politicians that will come in and will fund this research or even maybe this current generation of politicians will hear the constituents who are now like 18 or, or maybe 15 and, and maybe will be 18 by the next election in the States to change, change society and, and, and have gradually more and more people or maybe can have kind of the, this, this critical mass of people come to the realization. I think we don't need to change society like 100% of society. We need 10% of people to believe that this is something... Yeah, active minority. Yeah, exactly. Like, exactly. like the one that starts a revolution. Exactly, yes. This is where I'm going with. Yeah, exactly. So, and I think we're, we're almost there. I mean, I don't think we have 10%. I think right now maybe we have like 
two or three percent but like the, the growth is really exponential we need like those you know just a bunch of people being active and then we'll get to 10 percent within a couple of years i think and we're seeing this already like in europe in in some like in germany and spain there's transhumanist parties transhumanist candidates we're trying to get into the par parliament and that's that's the way to increase awareness first of all because you know regular people didn't even hear about transhumanism until they you know started following the election and they saw what this you know, candidates about what eradicating death, that sounds crazy. And then they start researching and then they're like, oh, okay, maybe it's not, not a bad idea after all. And so, yeah, I think this is the, the way we have to go about to, to popularize and eventually change society to, to create this kind of demand, demand for research, demand for a uh, sense of urgency in the researchers. And uh, I'm, I'm pretty optimistic that, you know, we will within you know, a very short period of time I'm more optimistic about this change in society than I'm about like practical research results in the time frame of five years. I'm definitely optimistic that society is moving to the right direction and it's changing fast. <laughs>